time to put down your rods and pick up your headphones. Join JC and Andy from Ebb Tide Tackle for The Outflow, the podcast talking all things lure fishing with hardcore fish shows from all over the world. Hi, Outflow listeners. Welcome back. Today, we are crossing the globe to sunny Southern California for a man who many know for his big bait, big bass fishing, but we know him over here for his exploits also with Big Murray Cod. Welcome, Mr. Big Bass Dreams, Oliver Nye. Well, thanks for having me, John. Excited to be here with you guys. Man, it's a it's a big, big pleasure. And uh, a lot of guys in Australia probably were following your stuff um, over the last few years. You know, I, I found you on YouTube um, two or three years back. But a lot more Aussies would know you now for a trip you did down on the last uh, winter with some buddies of yours. Yeah, it's been uh, almost – actually, it's exactly a year – since I was down there uh, with the boys chasing uh, my first Murray caught. So getting some flashbacks on my timelines the last couple of days, kind of bumming me out a little bit because there were plans for me to kind of revisit for my third trip down under. Yeah, that's, that's such a bummer, man. Like uh, for, we should get this podcast out pretty quick, but uh, in case there's any delay, we're right smack bang in the middle of COVID. So, you know, in, in terms of the timestamp, no one's doing a lot of traveling right now and international plans, you can forget it. I'm actually meant to be in Southern Oman right now. And uh, that, that just is out the window. So bummer for you, man. Um, last year when you, you first did that trip, we're, we're going to jump around and do a lot of talking and uh, exploring around both uh bass and big bait fishing and, and of course murray cod because a lot of our listeners are murray cod guys but first and foremost they're lure casters when you first did that trip last may there was a lot of eyes watching you man do you realize how many people were intently seeing what oliver and i did down under did you feel the pressure no uh it, it's always kind of surprising in the aftermath uh, going into exploring these new fishing cultures which you guys have several of your own I, I really don't know what to expect as far as the existing community uh, and how they would engage with what I'm trying to do, with what we're trying to do as a team down there with Big Bass Dreams Australia. Mm -hmm. uh, you never know until you do it. So going in, being in those remote locations, trying to document my firsthand experiences, uh, really none of that was in, in my mind, to be honest. Like I was focused truly on just trying to catch the biggest fish I could. And, and as you know, uh, that takes a lot of uh, focus. Yeah, man, that's uh, re regardless of the species, that takes, you know, all of your your, your mental energy and, and willpower um, for, for a fish like Murray Cod, which can be incredibly temperamental and, and lock-jawed. You know, you, you've multiplied it by a factor of many, in, in my opinion. From, from our perspective, when you came down under, it was very much like, oh, wow, here, here comes Oliver down under fishing for our Murray Cod. You know, we, we, I guess we kind of loosely know how you fish in a way, you know, without being on the boat with you, but, you know, having watched a lot of your vids, it, it's th – th there are a lot of people who are like, yeah, it's not going to work. He, he might be able to catch big bass, but, you know, watch Cod chew him out – sorry, chew him up and spit him out – um, but man, you guys hardcore proved that way wrong. Um, it was a very successful trip from an outsider's perspective watching you. Yeah, it was really special. And after everything that I've experienced, even after the last couple of years, including some of the international travel and, and diving into different fishing cultures like musky fishing, right? Fish of 10,000 mm -hmm. ass, uh, you know, big European pike in Spain. Uh, the Murray Cod, barra fishing last, um, I guess that would be going into your summer. Yeah. Uh, I still feel to this day Southern California trophy largemouth fishing is the toughest thing to do consistently. <laughs> and unless you've actually experienced that, you, you can't understand it. So everything else after that, as hard as it is, and that Murray Cod fishing was incredibly challenging. Like we still were able to find success because I'm just kind of, I'm used to that kind of adversity and those low odds, <laughs> maximizing 
potential. And yeah. Look, <laughs> it, sound, it sounds like your pedigree yeah, uh, is, is perfect for it. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's just like any sports, right? You, you tend to perform to the level of your competition and in your environment. So when I come from this extremely pressured fishery with small bodies of water where literally the same people are going around these small uh, dams, as you guys like to call them, and just pretty much taking turns on the five spots in the lake and throwing mm-hmm. everything in their tackle box at them. Like those fish become really conditioned really, really quickly. And you got generations of these fish uh, that have been su- submitted to that. And you have to be on your game, man, in the smallest details. And, like, they are everything, the most subtle nuances. So when I go explore a new fishery like trophy largemouth uh, or smallmouth fishing in the northern part of the, of the states or musky fishing in the Midwest or uh, Murray cod fishing down under, uh, it's really a lot of the same things. And if I'm catching one trophy largemouth a week here, like I'm doing really good. So yeah. if I went down there and spent, I think, 12 or 13 days in a row hunting these things and between the three of us fishing our butts off from uh, sun up to sun down we averaged just under a fish a day but i think i forgot what the number of, of meter fish that was um i think it might have been six or something uh, you know plus all the sub meters uh it was it it seems like it was easier than it was but it really wasn't i i, I don't um for a moment put it forward that you know you had a hot bite and you had it easy that's not ever going to come out of my mouth for one moment a fish a day uh, if, if we're talking about something with some quality behind it is an enviable record the, the, the if I look back on you know some of my trips to the best dams in Australia um, Topton Dam is a place with a, a famous reputation over the last decade it's been it's been the hot dam you know how some some waterways will have a boom period um yeah it it, it, copeton has definitely had that and a trip up there if you come away with a fish a day you are stoked man you've crushed it so for you to slide in from another country and i know you've got some good heads there um cal and josh and and uh with jacob crow as well you know they're, they're good guys they know their stuff but you still have to, you know, put your swim bait out there and, and do the right things and get a bite, man. It's 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 really enviable. So, you know, I think you, you without harping a point too much, uh, you guys and yourself especially probably earned a stack of respect for your efforts, man. Thank you. Thank you. And really, at the end of the day, as long as I can earn that respect from all these different uh, fishing communities, man, that's the, the highest praise and compliment that I could hope for I mean, it's almost as as cool as the actual fish catching experiences themselves uh, it's yeah it's... for sure man as far as um outward um accolades the, the acknowledgement of, of other anglers that hey that guy can fish it's about as good as it gets really i reckon yeah you know in our world uh, and even here in the states like i don't really care if someone doesn't like love me or like me but if i have the respect like we're good, man. Like it's just, you know, it's all I can ask for. Yeah, uh, you you definitely won't get everyone liking you. We know that. <laughs> I I love the way you deal with haters, man. It's very funny. Uh, you know, I've always uh, you know, it, it, back to that conversation about my environment, how I grew up. All right, I grew up as an undersized uh, basketball player, and right. Well, you know, people used to love talking shit to me, so I love mm-hmm. talking it right back. But you know, you you learn this fine line of of backing up what comes out of your mouth, and you know, you got to have a little gift for gab. And I've always enjoyed it as a, as another challenge. Like, okay, you want to battle wits? Let's do this. Like, <laughs> yeah, I'll take you on head on. The uh, the fact is that you've got a pretty good basketball game. I've seen some uh, some vids that you've posted from time to time. You know, chump on the court. Oh man, I just I, I'm I tend to be a, a jack of few trades because <laughs> I don't want to be a master of none, right? Yeah. Uh, I could score a basketball. I could stop most guys. Uh, my jumping and my quickness is gone now in my older age, but 
uh, I can do that and I can catch a fish. So <laughs> not very much else I'm good at. Bowling, billiards, um, darts, uh, <laughs> no sports, none of that. Like, <laughs> uh, I thought you were about to claim all of those things. I'm like, what? No, the, hid- I- the hidden secrets of Oliver. Um, has bass tournament fishing ever been part of your game? Like, I know it's not now, and I'm sure you know all the guys. Um, I, I I watch a bit from now uh, time and again. I, I get on little YouTube watching sprees. Um, I watch a lot of the stuff from the guys that aren't tournament guys, you know, the, the guys that give away a lot of info and intel, like, you know, the tactical bass and dudes. But then I'll find myself watching – tournaments and of course we've got carl and and love to watch carl jacobson but i i've watched a lot of the old stuff like kvd and um and iconelli um i actually read his book like seriously 20 years ago um and chris chris aldane i love watching him he, the, that guy's got a serious game but the the tournament scene's never been your thing or was it have you ever i, I don't know okay that's a great question well you know, I'm, I'm a part of this generation that grew up watching uh, bass fishing content through TV, uh, magazines, and really back in those days, like really the 90s, the only way to make it in fishing was to become a pro angler and a pro tournament. Mm-hmm. So that has always been something that I've wanted to do. And you'd see that throughout much of my early fishing career. I fished uh, every level, club tournaments. Uh, local team tournaments, uh, local pro-am tournaments. But as time went on, other avenues of uh, opportunity started opening up, namely social media uh, and having the freedom of these platforms to tell whatever story I want to tell has completely changed my life. So I no longer needed to become a tournament angler to make an impact in this culture. And I think that's the unique part of my story. However, uh, I'm also that kid that loves being driven by having a chip on my shoulder. And there's still enough murmurs in the background from people that don't think I can do it. Uh, <laughs> may push me over the edge and have me compete with the boys uh, on, the, on the higher tours, or at least try to. So, oh man, I'd, I'd love to see that. It, it, it's obviously got to come within the desire to do that. Um, I, I'd love it. That'd be awesome. It's just tough because there's an opportunity cost involved. Right? Oh yeah, big ones. So, like my 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 time is my most valuable commodity at this mm-hmm. point in my life, and has been for the last few years. And how I choose to spend it is the hardest decision that I have on a daily basis. So I can spend a year like I did in 2019 and try to scratch off these adventures and experiences of a lifetime. And that's going to be a tough year for me to beat. Uh, Mm. I I went and did a lot, saw a lot, accomplished a lot. But I wouldn't be able to do that if I was going to focus and really commit myself to competing at a high level. Because, like, those guys are the best in the world. You can't come at it half-assed. You'll get your butt kicked. Like, you have to hope everything lines up and hope and do everything that you can within your means not to blow any potential opportunities that come up. Like, the margins of error are so slim. I got good mates of mine that have missed the the Bassmaster invite by one spot and haven't got close since it's it's a tough thing to do so if i were to do it it'd probably take a two three year commitment and man that's a lot to ask of me right now because like i can go do whatever i want yeah you're in a pretty enviable and and unique position right now in your i guess your fishing career man it's um it's a it's a left fork in the road that's going to change things forever if you do go and commit that for a few years for sure yeah so it's always on the table and the timing of it has to be right. It's got to make sense uh, on fulfilling my own personal goals. And, and competing at that high level and winning at that high level has definitely always been one of my goals, especially because of the generation that I came from. But at the end of the day, is that more valuable than some of the 
really rad stuff that I've been able to do the last six, seven years. Like, I don't know, like maybe in the eyes of somebody else, but to me right now, I have to still say no. And then the last few years that have kind of gone by with changes in the fishing uh, industry and the culture of the tournament scene and the shifts with uh, new platforms like uh, Major League Fishing, now we're getting COVID. So if I had to chasing that last year and actually engaged in that in 2020, I'd be sitting with my hands, uh, you know, like sitting on my hands and doing nothing like all the guys waiting for some kind of clarity on some kind of schedule and the logistics yeah. of it. So in hindsight, man, I'm glad I didn't make the jump the last couple of years. Yeah, that'd, that'd be a huge bummer, wouldn't it, man? <laughs> like the, the, the prime years of your life, you want to put to the maximum use, whatever that is, whether it's adventure traveling, you know, do, doing the things that drive you and ignite you versus, you know, perhaps say this, this other challenge. What you don't want to do, though, is waste it, do you? That time is so precious. And that's something that's probably the most underlying message or important underlying message that I try to convey through all the content that, that we produce here is that, man, you guys, I hope you guys realize that life is short. And I think you're seeing a little bit of that mortality now uh, worldwide. Mm. And hopefully it brings a little perspective so that everybody can, you know, stay on that positive vibe and, and really try to, to, to experience special things and, and live those dreams, man. Don't be scared, but you just got to be smart about it. People take time for granted way too much, even in my own circles. Like, yo, like it's already, it's already May in 2020. Like, what have what have you done? <laughs> so true, man. So true. Like that, that that conversation around tournament fishing is an interesting one for me. I I really love the concept. Like I watch it. So you know, it's I'm giving up my my viewing time to to watch some of this stuff. But to do it, there's an element that doesn't gel with me because so often I see tournaments run or the hours are non-perfect times. They're on bad moon phases. They're, you know, they're daylight only type events. They're, they're run in all weather, which of course you've, you've, you know, you've got to, unless it's a safety factor. Whereas a part of my mind wrestles with, I want to catch the trophy fish. So I need to fish this moon phase at this time on this lake, not when the tournament tells me when to fish. And, and the other thing is I like to get away from people when I fish, not be part of, you know, a flotilla that's, you know, bombarding the lake trying to, to, to catch the biggest fish to win. So it's a it's a mental challenge to for, for me to get into that. It really is. Yeah, I think uh, all those factors that you just listed are really important in painting the picture of the context of why tournament fishing is still important to this day, right? They were the validating a force behind a lot of the principles behind a lot of the fishing techniques and concepts and lure making and uh, just mm -hmm. technology in our game because those guys are fishing uh, for their livelihood at the highest level and I feel like to, in today's fishing world too many people are oblivious to the impact and importance of that high level competition fishing and the service that it provides our culture and because they may not be getting the most attention from the masses anymore, it seems like it's not as important to way too many people. And that bugs me a little bit because they're, they're digesting and ingesting content on all these platforms, but like mis, misconstruing it as having relevance and importance. Okay. There's no filter anymore. Yeah. For yeah, good, good, good point. That is, is um, tournament fishing of in that level on the decline. Is it? I, I kind of picked up something there. I'm sorry. You there, bro? Yeah. What I, what I was just saying was, um, is is tournament fishing on the decline, or the popularity of it? I don't think it is overall. I just feel like the perception of its impact is on the decline yeah okay yeah yeah not so much the testing and proving ground that it was probably relied upon to be for so long yeah yeah um, 
Yeah, so your big bass journey, yeah, not so much as a tournament angler, but, but a guy who goes out and throws big baits and sometimes, often enough, catches, you know, very big bass. Where, where did that come out? It's a very Southern California thing, I feel. Uh, well, it kind of developed organically, really. And, and my fishing character arc, you know, started at the very bottom. My very first fish was a bullhead catfish, like one mm-hmm. of the least glamorous fish species we have in North America. And to a 10-year-old version of myself, I didn't care. I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I actually went out there and caught a fish. But then it became our panfish, bluegill, red ear, crappie were the next level. And then after that, it was learning how to catch trout in the wintertime and then catfish in the summertime. And, you know, I saw these guys on my local lake. And, man, these guys got a little bit more swag to them. They got a little bit more confidence, a little bit more style. And they were the bass fishermen. And even the guys that walked the bank, they didn't have to have a fancy bass boat, you know, but they were just different. And these fish they were catching were bigger than everything that I was catching. And so I was like, man, like, I want that. And then all of a sudden, you know, I became aware of all that content we talked about and that influence of becoming a tournament angler was the only option. So I started, you know, having, big, you know, big tournament dreams and, and wanting to, to do that at some point in my life. So I started trying to, you know, catch the five biggest fish I could anytime I went out. And I was really focused on getting as many bites as I could and just catching as many fish as I could. And that went on for years and years trying to put together a good tournament bag, you know, and, and creating these situations in my mind uh, and, and trying to put myself in the shoes and the mindset of a tournament angler or a multi-day uh, event because, like, all of that stuff is what's really out of my reach, man. I, I came from a, a really humble background, right? My, my, it was just me and my mom's. She had no money. Like, we had no money. So I didn't have a lot of resources at my disposal, but that lack of resource really taught me how to become re- resourceful. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. But I, I really just learned everything slowly over the course of, of an incredible amount of time on the water. And that's something that's hard to convey to the audience now. It's like, if you want to be good at something, you have to spend a lot of time doing this. And eventually I got tired of catching two and three pound, four pound fish and feeling super pumped when I would catch a five pounder because that's above average. Mm. And, and, you know, I'd see someone or, or I'd see these local guys that were trophy hunters as I was growing up and like how they were doing this consistently was just beyond me at the time. So I paid almost no attention to that or very little attention because I didn't have, I couldn't afford to buy the big reels they were using, the saltwater rods they were using at the time, you know, the, the 20 to $50 swim baits that were available at the time, like all of that was out of my reach. But uh, a $4 pack of plastic worms or a $5 pack mm-hmm. was within my reach. So I really just uh, let, let it just develop, man. And as I caught more fish and got more proficient at different techniques and catching more fish and doing well in these like club tournaments and stuff, I kind of just got tired of it and got burnt out and I found myself being more rewarded with that one bigger five to seven pounder than I was catching 50 dinks. Yeah. And, and catching big fish is its own intrinsic reward. Like one big fish every so often becomes so much more important than catching, you know, uh, say you're five every time you go out doesn't it when you get that trophy hunter mentality yeah and that that once that light switch was turned on i couldn't turn it off for probably six to eight years like i literally uh, fished all of my local lakes year round with a big bait uh, all the big baits at the time I, I spent an incredible amount of time with them and trying them in every situation that i could every way every way you could imagine fishing a particular swim bait i probably tried it or at least yeah. the ones I come up with and that that experience of all of those failures because that's what most of that was is failure is what taught me to identify windows of opportunity now and i can sit i can go out fishing with a plethora of rods on the boat and know when i should put down the regular you know traditional technique 
and pick up this specific big bait for this specific scenario because I have all of those years and hours mm. of experience to, to build this gut instinct that I have. And really that, that transferred to the Murray Cod stuff because at the end of the day, those are still big, conditioned, hard to fool fish that respond to many of the same factors that our trophy largemouth do. I mean, fish are fish. That, 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 that's so true, man. And I definitely want to focus in in a moment about the, um, you know, some of the similarities and contrast between the two species in your experience. But there was one little thing you said a moment ago that I resonate with so much. And it's the, the craft that you build up if your eyes are open and your mind's alert through the years of fishing, you know, say the same species, doing a variety of techniques, trying different things. It's that that's the stuff you can't learn on YouTube. That that's the stuff that simply it, it's an old phrase, but time on the water gives you. And there, there's no substitute for actually fishing and trying to nut something out and learning from your experience. And some of the richest rewards for me are when I look at a a weather situation, a lake, an inflow. I do all the math. And, and, you know, the, my, my fishing buddies, we, we chat about this endlessly. It's like, hey, we've got to hit it here. The right conditions are here. And if you, if you go to, you know, the spot you think it's going to be and you pull it off, that is worth so much as an angler, in my opinion. Oh, it's everything, man. And I hope that our viewers, especially on the YouTube platform, are taking the info that we're giving them and really using it as a foundation and a jump off point. To, they, to where it gives them enough confidence to go out there and attempt it and then see for themselves whether or not that fits their style of fishing or if it's something that they can add to their game. But create your own style and your own philosophies through your own experiences of it. So true, man. And, and you know, a, a lot of people put out their theories that, you know, their, their experiences have taken them to that point. And they're happy to share it and that might be their truth but it just might not be yours there, there, there's no substitute for your time your brain working and 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 you forming your own theories and and beliefs and values around around fishing it's it's this is what fishing is about in my opinion man not just catching fish uh, the learning part of this whole game and piecing the puzzle is what it's all about for me you know it's it's mentally stimulating more so than anything else that i do in life except maybe basketball because those factors are you know always changing depending on who you're playing uh but the the learning and the puzzle piecing and the decision making is ultimately what makes all the difference because every little thing that you're doing is a decision that you have to make whether it's the type of knot you tie the size of your line uh, whether or not to uh, barter with Oliver and getting rid of your black jungle ogre. Like those are <laughs> decisions we all have to make. Uh, and they never end. And, and the fish that we end up holding or not holding are a direct reflection of those decisions. So I think that's the fascinating part. And even, you know, recently I've been fishing with one of my really good buddies here in the States more than I had uh, since we were kids. And he's one of the best fishermen that I know, like, Bar, bar none. His name's Johnny uh, Nguyen, and you'll see him a lot in our content on both the Big Bass Streams YouTube channel and my personal. I've seen him. I've seen him for sure. Yeah. The dude's a fishy bastard, man, and uh, you know, in certain things, he's so much better than I am. So I'm always like open eyes, open book, like open mind, and taking what he's got so much confidence in, but also at the same time making sure I take a step back. And observing through my own perspective and seeing what I can take from him and add to myself. And if I see any weaknesses or opportunities, I share that with him. And we're really good at like not getting too butthurt at each other and letting our egos get you know uh, the better of ourselves. Like, no, I'm the man. Except I, you know, <laughs> I do. This is my boat, my trolling motor. Uh, you know, card on him quite a bit. Like, like <laughs> sorry. At the end of the day, I earned the the, the right to make these decisions. Um, but it's, it, I think it's really important for everybody to, to stay flexible because we can continue to learn from so many other people. And I mean, gosh, this guy was 
showing me how he loves to straight wind and slow wind or slow roll a jerk bait. And he catches a fish doing it. And I'm just like, all right, would have never tried that. I guess I'll have to try that next time he's fishing lethargic. So uh, it's, it's, fishing is a beautiful thing. And the fact that it is an ever-changing puzzle, because uh, as, as you know, uh, you could think you figure them out and go back out and face really similar conditions and find the exact opposite as far as results. Like, what? And those cod are probably the worst at that in my experience. Oh, man. The, the, in Lake Eildon's my local lake, and I've fished it for uh, – it's, it's, it's not a uh, – look, I've fished it since my childhood, but, you know, fished it properly over the last, I think, eight years. And there was a point – there's been two points where I thought I had it nailed. <laughs> and I, I'm bordering on that arrogance again now, but I won't let myself because I've been so humbled by it in between. Yeah, yeah, the fish will be the greatest uh, bringers of humi- humility every time. And those cod, you know, I try to be as precise and methodical and scientific in my approach because I was like, guys, like, you know, I was telling Josh and Kel, like, bro, like, I'm not down to wake up at 4 a.m. in the dark every day and fish until 8 p.m. into the dark. Day. Like, I got to back up footage. I got to recharge batteries. I got to still run my brand i still gotta manage this that and the third so i was trying to <laughs> down to the you know like four to six hour windows where i can be super hyper focused on trying to catch this giant freshwater fish but also attend to life and yeah. that's how i approach everything here when i'm in the states when i'm bass fishing for largemouth or smallmouth or musky fishing like i've got those things fairly well figured out to the point where i can spend those four to six hours out of a day on the water when I feel like I need to be, get the opportunities I need to hopefully capitalize on it and create the content that we share and then still run everything at the same time. Uh, And that didn't happen with the cod because when I went back (laughs) in the summer, uh, we spent a week fishing for them. You guys haven't seen any of the content from then yet because we were still trying to get through the content towards the end of the trip from my first go around. But uh, if it wasn't for like four hour window like we wouldn't have caught jack for a week Mm -hmm. hammered like nine fish in like four hours including uh, a metery and a couple 90s and like it was pretty obscene like and then the conditions really didn't change or at least we didn't think they changed so we thought we're gonna whack them again the next day uh and it didn't happen it was just like Mm. That, that's 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 Murray cod fishing for you right there. The the um the the effort you can put in, I think, when you are trying to work them out and trying to develop your own theories, you can't beat the hours on the water like those extreme hours. And for for me, if, if I'm doing cod fishing the the way I feel it should be done, if you're really trying to chase that that trophy fish. It'll actually involve three to four, maybe maybe even five some days efforts around what you see will be the opportunities for one of those bite windows. And when I when I go away, it can be like literally, all right, we're going out for this three or four hour period because of the, the mathematics say it in my mind that this will be the time. Then you're off the water trying to get some sleep. Then like literally you've just got to sleep and then you're back up again doing it. And it, it's a fatiguing taxing thing it doesn't have to be done that way but uh, it it lends itself to that so much yeah and, you know especially for someone like me who literally has never traveled further from home to yeah myself in that situation and who knows when i would get another opportunity to do this again so i mean we went at it full bore like balls to the wall for 13 days straight and doing exactly what you're talking about fishing all day long uh and being so exhausted that as soon as you hit that 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 um, sleeping bag, you know your eyes are shut and you open them again and it's time to go. It's like man, I feel like I just fell asleep. And, and doing it 12 nights in a row uh, was wild. But what other activity could you spend that much time doing and have that perception of time go by so quickly? Because those are probably some of the 13 fastest days of my life. 
I was talking to Cal, Cal True, uh, a, a while ago when we, we swapped over those rods. That you, you and I obviously swapped a, a couple of swim bait rods for the listeners. And Cal came to my house and we had a chat and we we're talking about your trip. And he said to me that, you know, when he when he finally got you on the plane and you were heading back to the US, he did not want to look at a fishing rod or consider fishing. He was burnt, completely fried from the, the effort that you guys had put in. Yeah, yeah, we, we definitely burned the candle on both hands. <laughs> uh, and I think, what did I do? I came home and had a little bit of a mini break, but really there was, there is no break for me, really. I'm either... Uh, fishing to capture the content or trying to process the content to get it out to everybody so they can hopefully share some of these experiences that we've been uh, luckily uh, lucky to experience and still I'm still behind I'm still not through uh, the entire September through December of 2019 and even some of the stuff in years past so uh, it's always a struggle and it takes a really special kind of person to be able to subject themselves to that kind of mental and physical <laughs> And I, a Murray Cod fishermen or fishos, as you guys like to call yourselves, are really similar to musky fishermen and are very similar to trophy largemouth fishermen because we are gluttons for punishment because there is such a high involved in the successes with these low percentage fish. And it makes all of those hours, days of struggle uh, worth it to me at least. And a few of the select few in all of those fishing cultures. I want to zone in now on some some of that that you're talking about. So o- over here, being a Murray cod fisherman my whole life, but you know, not not always a lure fisherman. There's an evolution I think that you go through probably that begins with bait with a lot of people. Um, it certainly did in, in in my case in my generation. But once I found lure fishing, there was there was no other kind of fishing as far as I was concerned, and that really hasn't changed. But all the cod lures to reflect back now were basically bass lures, you know, everything is. Its origins are unquestionable where they've they've come from. So, and clearly, you know, those baits work. The techniques have got a direct correlation. From a a guy now that's caught bass at their biggest and caught at their biggest because, like, you know, you've nailed the 120 on your first uh, solid effort at them, which is a considerable achievement for, for any cod angler over their lifetime, let alone a guy that flew in and had a, you know, had a sustained two week crack at it. I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective, and I'm sure the listeners would too, around both the contrasts with largemouth bass fishing or, or the fish behavior and the comparisons. Mm, man, at what level? There's so much we could, you know, discuss and compare and contrast uh really i find them to be quite similar i mean the biggest difference probably is that they are a river fish and they love that current uh because you know largemouth tend to like still water our smallmouth are more the river fish Uh, you you obviously find both in all of those environments but uh, learning how to more effectively target river systems and moving water systems was part of a big part of my learning curve. And I think some of the smallmouth stuff that I've been doing and some of the musky stuff, because they're also river fish originally, um, has really helped my cod fishing and identifying, you know, where I need to be casting to these targets and how to present these fish. But at the same time, like, man, like I feel like the door is wide open on your cod fishery because There's still so much yet for all of us to learn uh, in regards to how to catch these things. Like, I feel like I just scratched the surface on, like, ways to catch them. And and I don't know if you had seen that video uh, where Cal follows up a fish that I had follow, uh, a topwater bird lure, um, all the way to the boat and got it to engage and eat literally at the boat, almost, you know, right at the rod tip. But, like, they had never considered that those fish could be catchable. And from my musky fishing perspective, and even actually I caught a lot more largemouth bass, literally right at the rod tip, because that fish is so focused on the lure that 
I'm able to continue to keep their engagement and focus on that lure and end up catching them, like both side. When a lot of guys will just kind of freeze up and just get caught up in the moment and just stare at this giant fish like, oh my God, this thing is crazy. And I'm like, what are you doing? Keep moving that thing. Like, you can catch that thing. Like, so, you know, trying to provide new perspectives and applying them is probably the most fun I have. And finding those similarities is is really pretty easy, honestly. Because like I said, they're kind of just like a big, fat, large mouth that doesn't jump. Mm. So that changes things, right? It changes the mechanics of how we fight these fish. It changes uh, the tackle that we use. I see a lot of guys tend to over uh, overdo some of the terminal tackle, especially like on the hook end when we've had a lot of success in my experiences with thinner gauge hooks that get better penetration. And at the end of the day, for their size, like they don't pull that hard. So you no. can make adjustments, right? Versus a pair, like a 80 centimeter pair is, is, you know, straightening out stock hooks. Uh, so it's just understanding the little technical things about that. Uh, that fish and making us more efficient so that when we do get that one bite a day over this 12, 13 day adventure, we maximize it and hook it because there were times when we didn't hook these fish. Like I was experimenting, experimenting with new baits, hook styles and, and learning through failure, unfortunately, because we were getting three to five engagements from these fish a day. We just happened to land one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, probably relatively not uncommon to have that level of you know engagements raised fish versus you know versus bites sometimes you raise them and don't get a bite and and then that bite to conversion rate and and i find especially so on top water the conversion will be lower you it's it's just a fact um what's a good conversion i think if you if you're bringing home bringing to the boat one in two you've done well done really well um, that's that's a high conversion in my opinion. So, if you were heading to uh, a, a Murray Cod Lake, or in contrast, a Trophy Bass Lake in in SoCal, are you looking for those fish in the same places? Are, are, are you expecting to find the fish in the same points or or drop offs or you know is is that kind of behaviour the same? You know, what's interesting about like that fishery you're talking about yield in is as we pulled up and I'm looking at this lawn tramp and this marina, I felt like I was in Northern California. Right. That's up just like our drinking water reservoirs or dams here in, in the States. So I felt very comfortable. Like it, it literally looked exactly the same, except the fish that you had were a little bit bigger. So we did find success and parts of the lake that I normally would be targeting for a large mouth or a small mouth on my home waters. Yeah, that's, that, that's cool to hear from my perspective because one, one day I want to go and uh, uh, target bass in, in the U S and, you know, to, to, to know that some of your knowledge is quite relevant going over there. That's really comforting from my perspective. Yeah. I think you'd be pretty surprised at how similar our fisheries in the Northern part of California are to those fisheries uh, there. Wow, how good was that chat with John and Oliver? Join them on another episode of The Outflow soon. We have plenty more in store. Thank you for listening to The Outflow by Ebb Tide Tackle. Subscribe to the podcast to listen to other episodes and stay up to date with new releases. And don't forget to rate and review.